Traditionally, photography has been thought of as a record of events, a trustworthy document of the where and the when. Juan Funciberta states in his book Pandora's Camera that we agree that photographs are not literally true representations of facts. It is known that photographs have been manipulated in the past. Take, for example, the Stalinist photographs doctored to remove political enemies. It is also known that photography continues to be manipulated. Photography and truth have long been considered linked, and much discussion has centred on this. Scott Walden, a US professor of philosophy, points out that in 2003, Brian Wolski was fired from the Los Angeles Times after it was discovered that he digitally combined two images into one, which was then printed on the front page of the newspaper. He goes on to state that if there were not some sort of connection between photography and truth, then it is hard to see what all the fuss was about. So if we consider a photograph as a record that can be used to aid memory recall, what happens when we manipulate the content of the image? Throughout the history of photography, pictures have been cropped, dodged and burned to create a more pleasing aesthetic. When Photoshop 1.0 was released in 1990, a new age of photo manipulation was born. David Campbell argues that the mere act of taking a photograph is a manipulation of the record. We frame an image, deciding what information to include and what information to exclude, depending on the image's purpose. Writer Fred Richin argues that Wolski's use of manipulated imagery is not nearly as significant as the practices photographers indulge in each day to legitimise the staging of a photo opportunity as an authentically occurring event. If we look at Roger Fenton's images from the series Valley of the Shadow of Death, we see that as long ago as 1855, in some of the earliest event record images of the medium, that photographs do not always give an accurate representation of an event. Fenton famously took two images of the same location to record the battle that occurred there. If we look at them side by side, we can see that he has moved elements within the frame to create a different aesthetic. Whilst this isn't manipulating the photograph as an object, it is still manipulating the representation of how the event transpired. In this first image, we can see that the cannonballs within the frame are littered across the road, creating a chaotic composition that connotes the chaos of war. In this second image, taken on the same day, we can see that these schools are piled up on the side of the road instead. Whilst the two versions of the image are similar in nature, the two versions clearly have different connotations about the, how the siege of Sebastopol occurred. David King's 1997 publication, The Commissar Vanishes, explores how Joseph Stalin used photo manipulation to erase the memory of his political rivals. One notable example is the removal of Nikolai Yezov from Stalin's side. <coughs> this and other photographs from the era demonstrate the use of photo manipulation to erase all erases of somebody, allowing for photographically represented memories of them to be erased. In the words of David Cohen, historian and scholar on Russian studies at Princeton University, Stalin manipulated the science of photography to advance his own political career and to erase the memory of his victims. King's publication demonstrates the differing reasons behind photo manipulation. Whilst in Fenton's case, elements within the frame were repositioned to create a different composition, Soviet photo manipulations were concerned with suppressing information for political gain. Stalin used photo manipulation to erase, political to erase political rivals from official photographs, and by doing so, he attempted to erase the official record of their existence, in effect, attempting to erase them from history. The page shown behind me from David King's book shows just one of the many examples of photo manipulation employed by Stalin. In the top right-hand corner, Abel Yunikidze had been removed from the image. Stalin felt threatened by what he felt were Yunikidze's deliberate attempts to discredit his role in the revolution. In 1937, two years after the manipulated image on the right was published, Stalin ordered the execution of him. His radical actions demonstrate his belief that he had in imagery to act as a record for memory recall and the extent to which he went in an attempt to combat it. More recently, German Chancellor Angela Merkel was digitally removed from the Just We Charlie March in Paris 2015. This time, Merkel and other women were allegedly removed from the image on the grounds of religious modesty. The image behind me was published throughout many news organisations. The Israeli daily newspaper The Announcer published on their front cover a manipulated version shown behind me. Claire Cohen states that 
From looking at the version which appeared in print, you'd be forgiven for imagining that the head of Europe's largest economy, not to mention a major power player on the world stage, had been absent. This draws back to what Frank spoke about in 2003. Back then, the Los Angeles Times sent out a clear and powerful message about photo manipulation's role within photojournalism. He stated that the message to readers and to the paper's staff couldn't be more clear. Tampering, tampering with reality isn't a mistake. It's a violation of everything journalism stands for. This was referring to Wolski's photo montage that appeared on the front cover of the Los Angeles Times. In response to this, Lars Boring, World Press Photo's managing director, states that it seems some photographers can't resist the temptation to aesthetically enhance their images during post-production, either by removing small details to clean up an image, or sometimes by excessive toning that constitutes a material change to the image. Both types of retouching clearly compromise the integrity of the image. This comment was directly related to the rejection of 20% of the images submitted to this year's World Press Photo Competition on the grounds of excessive image manipulation. It is admirable that, that World Press Photo Competition's gatekeepers are taking the job of actively searching out manipulated entries seriously. It should also be noted that many Western news organisations, such as the BBC, work hard to prevent falsified imagery from being disseminated to the consumer. Phil Coombs, an editor of the BBC, argues that whilst computer software can help to detect anomalies within an image, the main test of authenticity is around who took the photograph in the first instance. Organisations appear to work on a mutual trust that photojournalists will not manipulate imagery to send to the news outlets and vice versa. Part of the remit of many photo editors, such as Phil Coombs, is to check for the validity of the images and, where necessary, make the editorial decision not to publish them. Clearly, as the case of Brian Wolski demonstrates, this is sometimes not enough. It could be argued that it's the responsibility of the consumer to understand that imagery does not speak a total truth and that photography's relationship with fact is a slippery one at the very least. While we understand the moral reasons for not tampering with photojournalistic images, the effect that viewing manipulated imagery has on memory is less well known. Whilst Walden discussed the link between photography and truth, Saatchi, Agnoli and Loftus explored how photo manipulation of two notable newsworthy events, the protests at Tiananmen Square in 1989 and the 2003 protest against the Iraq war in Rome, affected how people recalled the events. This suggests that people are still under the impression that photography is a truthful representation of the situation. Manipulations made to the photographs tricked many of the participants who were exposed to the doctored images into believing that the events transpired in a different manner. In particular, participants who viewed the doctored image behind me at the Tiananmen Square protest estimated that a much larger amount of people took part in the protests. This suggests that viewing the doctored image may alter the way in which the viewer recalls an event. The study suggests that being exposed to manipulated imagery tricks our brain into committing a source monitoring error, that is, where false information is mistaken to be the source of a memory, and thereby altering our perceived understanding about how the events transpired. Von Kuberta explores the idea of how the context in which we experience images affects how we believe their authenticity. In his book, Sputnik, he explores the relationship between manipulation of images and the power of the political elite, in particular with the relation to the manipulations employed by Stalin, as discussed earlier. Using a combination of archive material and falsified imagery, he binds together a narrative purporting to show the life of a cosmonaut that was covered up by the Soviet state. Whilst the images aren't manipulated in the same sense as those by Wolski, the narrative is completely fabricated. He cleverly curates a mixture of archive photographs with his own images to create a series that appears to be a factual record of events, yet is in fact quite the opposite. This and other projects of Funky Berta's raise the interesting question about the power of propaganda to manipulate the proletariat for the purposes of the political elite. We consume vast amounts of imagery without understanding the purposes behind them. He highlights this fact that the political elite can utilise this to sway the beliefs and opinions of consumers. Photo manipulation within the news industry is regarded by many as poor practice, 
Not only that, but as Frank said, it's a violation of everything journalism stands for. Whilst the practice of photo manipulation by some organisations remains present, there are other organisations such as the BBC and World Press Photo who are working to actively eradicate excessive editing and manipulation of imagery. Because imagery is one of the key ways in which information is disseminated, then falsified content must have an effect on people's memories of the events which they represent. Perhaps this is due to the perceived bond between photojournalism and truth within the Western world. This relationship is a fraught one at best, and it must be remembered, as David Campbell argues, that the mere act of taking a photograph is a manipulated representation of an event. It seems that image manipulation is here to stay. News organisations are beginning to take responsibilities for safeguarding consumers from manipulated content on board. As studies suggest that manipulated imagery has an effect on what people recall of events that have been reported on. Ladies and gentlemen, the museum will be closing in 10 minutes' time at 4 o'clock. The museum will be closing in 10 minutes' time at 4 o'clock. Thank you. That's where I am now. Studies suggest that manipulated imagery has an effect on what people recall of events that have been reported on. And as such, it seems important to attempt to follow suit and protect the status of the photograph as a record, albeit one which is not a total representation. Thank you. I think at the moment there's a sort of understanding that if you're using photographs for photojournalistic purposes, then you shouldn't manipulate them. Uh, but I'm sort of swaying towards something that David Campbell said recently, but we should stop looking at whether or not a photograph's been manipulated and judging on that, but look at why a photograph's been manipulated. Has that added something to the story that we wouldn't be able to get otherwise? Um, but then again, that's also added through the context that the images are shown with, with the texts and captions that they're shown with. So it's, I'm sort of a little bit in the middle there. Any other questions? Yeah? When you said that so people have been removing people from photos, <coughs> and obviously I'm assuming that you agree that that's wrong, so with the manipulation of memory, what do you think that's going to do in the future with things? Do you think there are moments that have happened today in, in sort of recent times that could change our perception? Because obviously this is out there, that people know these images are being manipulated, but do you think there might be any occasions at the moment where people might not know that things are being manipulated, like the Angela Merkel one? I think in, in sort of the Western world, um, people, there's a lot more consensus that images shouldn't be manipulated. But certainly in um, sort of places where there's less free press, such as North Korea, for example, there's quite a few examples of photo manipulation from there. It is passed off as real. Uh, and the, the people who are viewing that imagery don't necessarily understand that that is falsified. So I think potentially there could be issues there. But certainly in the Western world, it's not as much of a de big deal anymore. Any other questions for you at all? Yeah? Um, you mentioned about Funky Bells' work um, on like, fictional narratives. Uh, when you first saw, like, saw his work, did you believe in his work? Or were you questioning the whole time when you were in? When I first saw his work, I already heard that it was fictional narratives, so I, I don't really know what I'd think if I didn't already sort of understand that, but certainly from looking at it, I think if you didn't know, you could quite easily be drawn into that sort of, traps not the right word, but that sort of idea that it is a, a curated archive or something. Yeah, looking to the manipulation of images, um, you that they have the ability, manipulating photographs, to affect someone's memory and completely change it from how the event actually took place? It, there's not that much sort of stuff out there that looks particularly past how people have manipulated imagery to manipulate memories of past events uh, in, in the news, certainly. If there have been sort of studies that have looked at it in sort of family photography and things. 
Um, but I think certainly as, as the case with um, Tiananmen Square shows, it can manipulate to an extent people's recollections of events because we now use photographs in such a way to sort of add, to aid memory recall, but by looking at one that you don't realise is manipulated, then that surely must have some form of effect on, on how we remember what we think we should remember. Yeah. Uh, do you think there should be, you know, could basing it on this audience here, we're also, or most of us are actually most well informed about this issue. Um, do you think it, there should be some sort of education to the masses, shall we say, about the, the potential for photography to be affected? Do you feel that that's necessary so that news can still remain its, uh, still sort of continue with its, its credibility? I think to an extent, that possibly something along the lines of what they're starting to do in magazines with photo manipulation of, of um, models and things, where magazines are starting to sort of acknowledge that somewhere within, within the spread. And if there are photo composites, newspapers generally do put that on now. Um, but I think to, to many people, they don't read the small text, but the image is now such an entry point into the story that they just presume that, that image is real. So I, I think there should be some form of education, but I don't know quite how you'd go about sort of putting that across, across to sort of the more general public. Uh, I don't see, well, I certainly don't know myself how, how you'd go about that. Any other questions for you at all? No? Thank you very much.